The power in the valley, what powered the valley? Well, from what I've said, it's people, and it's people's ideas. What ideas? What, what happened? Well, I'm looking at the sort of rise of the powers in the valley. Powers past or something, I think it said in the, in the title or the, or the blurb. And so, you know, how far back can we go? Well, we've got to go back to the beginning, haven't we? And we all know that the beginning is 1066, and we all know what happened in 1066. And some of us know what happened in 1069. Uh, I presume I'm a descendant of one of the relatively small number of survivors um, when William the Conqueror came north and started a program of ethnic cleansing. And the few people who escaped, um, most of them got to the Lake District. Some of them came to the Calder Valley because it was a dense, deep, dark, unhealthy valley full of wild beasts and biting insects where nobody in their right mind would go unless they were trying to escape from something worse. And the Norsemen, who were trying to set up a, a Norse kingdom in the north of England, which is what irritated William, um, they fled. And they didn't stay in the valley long. They moved out onto the slopes of the hills. And they weren't village builders. They were small holders. And um, so they settled in and among the existing Danish and Saxon villages that managed to stay out of the way of William's armies. And, and that's the sort of scene. And what were the ideas that were important? Well, survival. And survival is quite a good uh, prod to thinking up what to do about it. And um, they went in for self-sustainability. Among other things, they took their sheep, got the wool, the kids combed it, the women spun it, the chaps wove it, and I'm not quite sure who it was that cut it up and made it into clothes, grandma or somebody perhaps, if there was one. Uh, and they had a little domestic industry, and it was quite a good idea. And uh, this was therefore very sort of rural, very sort of self-sufficient little valley tucked away in the hills. But technology begins to invade, doesn't it? Technology and ideas come in. And the first technology that really made a mark on this valley, um, the piece of it that made the mark on the valley still exists. It's just across the other side of the river. It's Hebden Bridge Mill. It was water power, and that mill was built in 1314. So that's pretty early technology. Um, but it was very important uh, because it took over from hand technology of the ladies of the household throwing the oats into a bowl and rubbing them with a stick until they were exhausted to try to grind the oats up. If you've ever tried oats, not easy to grind. So a wheel and a stone that could do it better, technology. It improved the diet of the people living here enormously. It also enhanced the pocket of the Lord of the Manor because everybody growing oats had to take them to his mill to be ground. And um, so we had technology there. And there was a small timber bridge at the side of the mill. And um, the cloth making industry and the clothes making industry was taken off to such an extent that the hooves of the pack horses crossing that wooden bridge beat it to death. And the stone one that was built to replace it a little bit downstream um, survives today as it's known as the old bridge. It's actually the second bridge in Hebden Bridge. And so the technology of the clothing industry was developing a pace. Um, the first cloth hall, as opposed to a wool hall, I think I've disconnected somebody. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, was built in Hebden. Am I moving about too much? No, I think it's this one has a really awkward clip. I don't know if you've got. Kind of needs a thick bit of fabric to clip onto, which is quite difficult to do. Okay, let's try that. Well, you get the picture. <laughs> uh, everybody, everybody in their uncle was was busy at it at work and generating new ideas, and at the same time inventing, inventing better ways of um, spinning and weaving and so on. And the cloth hall in Hepton Stall in, in the 1400s had been going for a long, long time before. A chap who had been up in Scotland trying to persuade the Scots not to uh, separate themselves from England um, 
uh, set off on horseback to have a bit of a holiday, and he, he rode all around the island of Great Britain, and he described where he went, uh, Daniel Defoe. Um, when he came here, he probably thought he was back on um, on the island with the, with the castaway, but he described it in pretty wild terms. But he was impressed by what he called one continued village. You know, one of the big advantages of this area, there wasn't a lord of the manor in the sense of a, a big building and great estates and things like that, because the land here is just rubbish. Nobody wanted to farm it, really. And um, so he found all these smallholders, each house within hailing distance of another. But then he talked about the population. All employed, each with their hands sufficient for their upkeep. You know, the whole family were just working, working, entrepreneurs to the last person. And, and that's the heritage of this valley, and that heritage has continued. And uh, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that the other WW, you know, we all know about WWW, but the one that came before it was WWIR, the Worldwide Industrial Revolution, which of course is still expanding as we speak. Uh, it began under those circumstances here, in my view, uh, there's a lot of historical evidence to support it. So when you talk about power in the valley, it was the power of ideas and then the power of manufacturing and the technology of manufacturing better and better. You know, so I went on to spinning wheels and a frame propped up against the wall, went to a, a primitive wooden, wooden loom and that sort of thing. So they were developing their technology as they went along. Uh, and then you got people like... Um, Sir John, the Lord of the Manor of Wadsworth, um, he thought, well, there's these things called water wheels, you know, heard about them in, in Roman times, and uh, although their water wheels were a bit different, and um, in the Middle East and so on. Uh, and he wanted to build a mill with a water wheel, so he, he was taking his own leap into a new kind of technology. Um, well, 1314 to 1485, not that far, apart as things go and these wool makers must have eyed this big wheel going round in the river and thought it's not a bad idea really you know we could save a lot of time um if we could harness that to uh, to run our spinning wheels and our our um, weaving frames and they did and uh, over the next few hundred years well by by the time that defoe came they were just at the start of it that's the name of the chapel was wandering about writing it all down. Um, they were just about at the start of the transfer from domestic production to what you might call industrial production manufacturing. And during the 1700s, more than 250 mills with water wheels were built, not to grind corn, because there wasn't that much of it, but to produce cloth. Every valley around here, they, they were extremely fortunate here in the topography. I mean, this didn't happen in the Cotswolds. They, they continued to thrive on selling wool. Here, people were making cloth. They were playing the value-added game. They were adding the value of their hands to, to the um, product. And uh, so they were really fortunate in the climate. You, you might not think that we're fortunate in the climate here all the time, but um, for them at that time, they were. And it wasn't all that good. couldn't grow wheat. We could grow oats. Um, but... They had lots of rivers. And the other thing they were fortunate about was that when the ice melted at the end of the Ice Age, the ice over Manchester and Rochdale and Burnley and so on was thicker than the Pennines are high. And when the ice melted, it melted at the edge, which ice has a bad habit of doing. And therefore, we got lakes penned in between the ice sheet and the Pennines. And because the ice sheet was higher than the Pennines, the water came this way. And there weren't any ice sheets on this side of the Pennines because you need precipitation to make ice sheets as well as low temperatures. Here we had the low temperatures, but all the snow dropped on that side of the Pennines. So it came this way, did the water, and we got the Colour Valley. It gouged out um, a sort of 200 metre trench through the hills that we now delight in. Um, but the other thing was that the underlying geology here is alternating hard and soft rocks. 
if you look at the hillsides here, they go down in steps. If you look at the river, they go down in steps as well, because where they're running through soft rock, they wear it away quickly, and then they come to a band of hard rock, and there's a waterfall, or rapids, perfect place to build a, a water mill with a wheel. So, you know, they were all set up. They got the sites, they got the ideas, got the evidence, and all these hundreds of water mills were set up. And uh, 250 years after the cloth hall was built in Hepton's cell, it became redundant. It was far too small. Um, and it's still there, just a little cottage at the bottom of the churchyard with a plaque on the wall. Um, so they built the Peace Hall in Halifax instead. Quite a jump, really. Um, but like a lot of historical events, the Peace Hall was out of date before they built it because the factories had started to use coal and steam and they were building big mills. So at the same time as they were building the Peace Hall, they were building Dean Clough. And Dean Clough had its own showroom. It didn't really need to take its cloth to a market to sell it. But the Peace Hall was so busy that it only opened for sales, you know, Gosh, I wish the retail trade was like that now. They only opened for sales for a couple of hours on Saturday morning and, and, and they closed at lunchtime. And then you got until four o'clock to pick up what you'd bought. So it was, it was busy, but it was going out and the mills were beginning to take over. And so, you know, we got this great industrial revolution taking place here before it started anywhere else. The, the parish of Halifax was the richest place in the world in the late 17th century. And... The, that probably meant, you know, give a few people who own gold mines and so on, probably meant that it was the richest place in the British Empire, which probably meant that it was the richest place in the world uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, it all went from there. Halifax was a, an important city before Leeds and Manchester assumed prominence as, as more trading cities than manufacturing. And uh, the manufacturing grew up around them. So that's the power in, in the valley that I'm interested in, in, in talking about. And, and it's relevance to today, you know. We've kind of run out of ideas today. I know you're all dealing with bites, and there's, I presume, we, well, I presume we're talking about computers and things, you know, not zoos. And um, so, um, and there's been the odd development here and there in the, in the, in the history of the WWW and so on. Um, uh, but nothing to parallel the, 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 the absolute um, impact of industrialization throughout the world. Uh, in the WWW is a sort of subsidiary that's it's one of the children of that. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking at something really, really significant here. Now, it's um, 2025 is the 300th anniversary of Daniel Defoe's description of this area. And one of the things I'm proposing is that in 2025, um, if we all survive to that time, and who knows what we'll be doing, uh, but um, uh, there are some who say that we shall all starve to death before we get there over the next week or two, uh, but that's politicians for you. Um, they, we should have a festival. We should have it here. And we should celebrate Daniel Defoe's book about his travels throughout the island of Great Britain, in particularly here. There are so many unique circumstances came here. Most of the places he went, there were lords and serfs. Here there were independent people and independently minded people. And it's gone on like that. It's a very independent, I mean, I'm part of the old independently minded um, awkward squad of, of the original um, Hebden Bridge in Calder Valley. Uh, and I have every intention of getting more so, you know, when you get old. You, when, you get to, when, when you're old, you can say anything to anybody, can't you? And they don't take offence. <laughs> I was in a meeting not long ago in Spain, and we were having a bit of an argument, and I rather upset him over there. Uh, and he, he happened to be a policeman as well as being a Spaniard. He was a Spanish policeman. What a combination. And he got so incensed about what I was saying, he, he got up. And then he drew back and he said, if it wasn't for his age, I would hit him. I thought, well, there are some bonuses, aren't there? And so it's all true. Um, so where are we at now? We've got a lot to celebrate. The unique circumstances of this area being 
having very, very poor soil and therefore not supporting great landed estates or great monasteries like you find up in North Yorkshire. Um, because a lot of the Norman lords didn't want to be bothered with the north of England, so they, they got some religious order to look after it for them. And, and we got Fountains Abbey and all the others uh, out of that, but nobody built an abbey in the Calder Valley. I mean, there just wasn't enough agricultural productivity here to pay for anything like that. And there probably weren't any monks that wanted to come and live here. Uh, only, the only ones that wanted to get me here were the sort of ne'er-do-wells that escaped from the, the Norman um, killing spree. And well, these were independent people, rugged independent people, and they came up with ideas and, and they carried on developing ideas and, and they developed this thing. So we got the people, we got the minds, we got the imagination, we got the spur of necessity because they needed to survive. And we got the geological landscape that lent itself to waterfalls. We got the climate that lent itself to floods, and lots of rainfall, to run water wheels. And, uh, and we developed the markets. And then we began to develop more and more different sources of power, and eventually different sources of uh, transport. You know, the first railway across the Pennines came through Hebden Bridge. Um, the first canal um, uh, across the Pennines came through Hebden Bridge. And, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a remarkable history, and it's a history of ideas as well as, 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 all, as all the rest. Uh, and it's continuing. And, you know, there are some remarkable things going on in this area. Uh, we went through a very bad patch in the 50s and 60s when the textile industry collapsed um, due to the um, uh, tariffs being removed and imports flooding in. Um, and the, this place became a ghost town. But it, it recovered. It, it, you know, people came together. Uh, I forget the name of the first speaker who was talking about mutuality. Um, it happened here. People came together. Working parties came out on the streets. Every weekend, people turned out for three hours, in the rain, in the snow, whatever, to scrub this place clean, to get rid of the dirt and the disorder, and to build a new economy. And, and you, you biting people are very much a part of this new economy. You know, whereas it grew up as individuals working in, in little cottages, and if you walked around the area in those days, you'd hear the clack clack of a loom from nearly every cottage as the hand loom weavers, weavers were working hard. It, it's not quite the same now. You don't hear the clack 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 of a loom. You don't really hear it at all, but if you've got very good hearing, you might hear the tap 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 of a keyboard. And there's a lot of people in this area now with independent one person, two, three, four people businesses based on the tap tap taps of keyboards and doing, there's a lot of offices in this building. There's lots going on. And um, in a way, this is a resurgence. The economy of this area is, is happier in many ways and it's building on the history. It's, it's, it's a reinvention of the um, domestic industry of the past that was very much about the use of the hands and the use of materials. Um, and now it's uh, using, um, still using imagination and ideas, and, uh, uh, and, and it's prospering, I think. You know better than me, but I, you know, as a bystander, I get the feeling that it is prospering. There are all these people doing things which I confess I don't understand at all. There all these waves flying about in the air. I mean, my computer talks to a cloud. I mean, how daft can you get? And, and that cloud talks to my other computer. And occasionally they both get it wrong. Um, but that's, that's the way it goes. So it, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I'm absolutely fascinated by it, the history of this and all these things that, that plug into it. And um, so uh, where's it going to go from here? You know, well, hopefully it's going to go, it's going to carry on. One of, one of my projects of the past, going back to the 1980s, uh, was to save, well, if I went back to the 1970s, my project was saving that building the first building in Hebden Bridge, Hebden Bridge Mill, the, the, the mill that Sir John de Thornhill, the Lord of the Manor, built in 1314, is still there inside that building. It's been extended in every direction. You can't see much of the original because it's, it's, it's wrapped up in layers of later development. Uh, but that's, that's the heart of it. And then the next one that I took on, after I took that on, uh, was um, the next one upstream, Nutcliffe Mill. I thought I'd go for a biggie. 
Um, it was going to be demolished, as that was. That was going to be demolished, and I had a big row with the owner. Uh, and he said, well, I've sold it. I've sold it to a demolition contractor. He's just buying it for the stone. He said, if you're so serious, he said, you conservationists, you're all cheeky and buggers, really. But, you know, you're telling me what I should do with my property. I'm not joining. You want to do it, do it. Put your money where your mouth is, is an old Hebden Bridge phrase. And he said, I'll sell it you. You can buy the stone and you can keep it in position if you want. <laughs> uh, well, I said, I haven't any money. He said, don't be daft. I haven't any money. What's money got to do with it? You want to do something, you borrow it. Go to the bank and ask them. Oh dear, I've been brought up that you didn't borrow money. And I said, but they'll want it back. I, I, <laughs> I got this pitying look from Mr. Greenwood. It was called Mr. Greenwood. I won't tell you which one. And there's so many of them, you won't be able to identify them. Um, he said, of course they will. He said, look, lad. Yeah. Felt about so big. Uh, I think he was probably uh, younger then than I am now. But anyway. Um, he said, you borrow the money, you make it work a bit harder for you than it does for them, and you live off the difference. And that's called business. Oh, I thought, oh, I do not thought about it. And I used to be a fairly bright lad, and I thought, well, I can't gain him, really, he's right. So I borrowed the money and bought it. I was terrified, terrified. Terrified it was going to fall down. It took me five years of working ten hours every Saturday and every Sunday before I could even get anybody to agree to be a tenant in it. But gradually people came and rented bits and that funded the next bit and so on. So after ten years, when the browsers were beginning to decline a bit, I looked at Nutcliffe Mill and the old West Yorkshire County Council had it on their demolition list. You know, that five story, 35,000 square feet lump up the valley there. Well, I went to see them at the county council and said, you know, it's going to cost you about £50,000 to knock this place down, the way councils spend money. Uh, I said, why are you doing it? Well, it's unsafe and uh, nobody wants it. It's, uh, it's been abandoned. Um, I said, well, there's a lot of things like that about. We can't just knock them all down. Oh, well, I mean, I think they were trying. Um, I said, well, I'll relieve you of the problem. What do you mean? I said, well, you can give it me. That'll save you £50,000. <laughs> then you can give me the £50,000. <laughs> uh, well, it worked. <laughs> I actually bought Nutcliffe Mill for a pound. I mean, there has to be an exchange of cash, apparently. And so um, I gave... Uh, the chairman of the, of the county council, a pound note. I think it was a paper pound note in those days. And, and she uh, accepted it. And uh, they gave me some money. And, and then the government, through various uh, things, gave me some money. We got um, rural programme money through the rural development uh, body, uh, which I wasn't a member of at that time, so it wasn't inside a training. They made me a commissioner on the Rural Development Commission to stop me applying for grants, I think. <laughs> and uh, then I uh, got some, uh, I got some urban aid money, which of course is absolutely strictly illegal, because Ebden Bridge was either rural or it was urban. <laughs> well, I didn't care. I pocketed it, and uh, and then I, I got some European money, just short of a hundred thousand pounds. Um, but we didn't, because it was, it was, you have to do the work first and you get the grants afterwards. And uh, I'd arranged with the manager at Lloyd's Bank, you know, when A, they had a manager and B, they had a bank, um, <laughs> to, uh, to borrow the money on the strength of a letter from the Department of the Environment in London, Secretary of State himself, you know, promising to pay um, the... Uh, 100,000 when the European money came through, but it didn't. Some lawyer in Brussels found a little clause and where it said that, was well, it usually said, everywhere else it said, 
eligibility for this grant is public sector, private sector, and voluntary sector. Somebody who wrote the one for this area missed off and voluntary sector. So Brussels refused to pay it. They said it would be illegal to pay it. I said, well, I shouldn't worry about that. Everybody else has paid it. And uh, anyway, it never came. Uh, and the bank got very cross and uh, threatened to take the building off us and put us in jail. Actually, uh, my colleague at the time, David Short, now Lord, you know, the Right Honourable Lord Short, um, we were actually locked in the manager's office in the bank in Ebden Bridge until they'd sorted it out. I mean, a meeting about what was going to happen. So I wrote to our MP at the time, uh, and I just put across the top of the letter, in big red, red letters, help, 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 help. You know, spelled the case out and said, the press are sniffing round. What am I to say? This is just going to blow a hole in the whole government policy of public-private voluntary sector cooperation. I got a cheque in four days, an actual piece of paper, you know, those old-fashioned things, uh, in four days, for £91,000, from the Department of the Environment, with a little letter saying, don't tell anybody where you got this from. <laughs> <laughs> because they'd already paid the £95,000 that we were using as matching money for the European money. So instead of it being 50-50, it was 100-0, which is against all the rules. So when you hear people on the telly these days talking about it being unconstitutional, there's no such thing. <laughs> what they do, what they want to do, they do. Make no mark, no mistake. And it's happened better than some of the other systems that are around in the world. So that mill was saved. Um, we, because there was... I set up Pennine Heritage then, so we had a trust, Pennine Heritage, and the trust, Pennine Heritage, raised about one and a half million pounds to re-roof that building, put new floors in, put new window frames in, get it back to a working building. And the idea was to turn it into an industrial nursery, small businesses and so on, a bit like the, the wing here. You know. And we got a few people in, and if you're letting places off to small but start-ups, you know, you finish up with some that are successful and you finish up with others that stop paying the rent and leave you with a pile of rubbish in the middle of the floor. Um, we got some of both. And uh, some of those that grew, so were growing a bit, but one of them was called Colrec. And it was growing a lot. And every time somebody else's space became vacant, they said, can we have it? And look where they are today. You know, there's something like, uh, um, I don't know, 200 jobs or something like that in Hebden Bridge and, and sort of not just bottom of the pile jobs either um, because we saved the building. And this was part of our strategy in the early days. This place is down on its knees in the 60s. Get working parties out, clean it up, get rid of the rubbish. Uh, you know, if you're going for an interview, we'll put your best suit on. And uh, uh, so we put Hebden Bridge's best suit on and persuaded people to start cleaning buildings. Then we said, well, now that we've done it, we better get people to come and look at it. Let's spread the word. So we had all sorts of daft festivals. We had a weekend called Awake. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. We had all the arts performing groups in town on all the same weekend. Every venue in town was full. Fantastic. There was a marquee on the park with everything from John Bull and his puncture repair kit to a four-hour unexpurgated version of King Lear. And it was full of people. I mean, it was really fantastic. I don't know anybody else here old enough to remember it, but 1972 was the date. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a tremendous event, and there were lots of them. And uh, Swiss Week, anybody remember that? You know, it was all sorts of things. We had Dorothy Sutley for a tobacconist shop in a, in a pair of hot pants, pretending they were la lederhosen, trying to yodel on the hillside near Weasel Hall, while Yorkshire TV were filming. I mean, the noise just... <laughs> but people came to look. What are all these peculiar folk doing? And then the third element was we wanted to translate the um, visitors into the best visitors of all, the ones that stayed 365 days a year, because the population here had been falling like a stone. The population of Ebden Bridge used to be about 7,500, and it shrank to about 4,000 over, a, you know, uh, 10 years or so. Um, 
And people just abandoned their houses. You know, I'll make you absolutely green now. You could buy a really nice cottage for 50 quid. I know somebody who got one for a penny. And uh, those, I think those days have passed on a bit. It's a long time since I bought a cottage, but I think they're a bit more than that now. So, uh, and then the final part of our effort, save the mills. Because we didn't want to be a commuter place. You know, we're near, near enough to Leeds and Manchester, but we wanted things to happen here. We wanted ideas to flourish here. We're back to ideas, imagination, and, and, and get up and go. And, and that's, that's what we started to get. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm on dangerous territory, but house prices have gone up too. So I was on this brains trust in the trades club, and uh, they were going on about house prices. They were blaming people who had upped the reputation of Ebden Bridge. They were blaming the estate agents for putting prices up. I stood up, I said, don't blame anybody else. I know who put the prices up in Ebden Bridge. I said, it's you. You are the people who put the price. The, the person selling a property determines the price at which it sells. And you all want to get a bit more than the chap next door got. And that's what puts the prices up. And it's a sad fact. And because the prices are going up, we don't have as many vibrant ideas generating people moving in. We have more um, fairly well healed public sector pensions moving in. Now, I know I'm on dangerous ground saying that, and I'll, I might not live to see the end of the week, but uh, it's a fact. And so um, I'm not being rude if the cap fits. I mean, most of you don't look as if you're on, on pensions yet. I am. I'm a benefit baby. The government gives me a pension every month. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. But um, it, it, it does have its drawbacks when everybody's doing that because it kind of you know, makes everybody feel a bit too comfortable. The people who really set this area going were escaping ethnic cleansing and hungry and they had to do things, you know. So but that's what that's where we've come from. Um, and that's where we are. And you know, I hope we're gonna get progressing and I have every intention of getting this this part of the valley, talk about power in the valley, um, recognised as the centre of WWIR and given world heritage status, which I know isn't going to bring the house prices down, <laughs> but it, it is going to help more people to be concerned and supportive and helpful about keeping this amazing heritage that we've got here. And if I want to leave you with any message, you know, for, for Wuthering Bites, it doesn't matter what sort of, but this is such an, uh, an amazing part of the world. Uh, you know, and we've a long way to go in ideas, haven't we? Um, I, I've been doing my bit over there. Um, the government are, are going on about being zero carbon by 2050. Well, I've just written to them and said, well, what's keeping you? I've been zero carbon since 2014. And I have. Over there, we generate all our own electricity, and in fact, we generate four times as much as we need. And we sell the other three quarters to the grid. So you're all living on my electricity. <laughs> so you better be good. I might turn you off. Um, and part of that electricity um, goes into a couple of machines called heat pumps. Um, and they take heat out of the water. Now, I've got all this up on the walls in there, and customers come in and they read it. Most people have tremendous difficulty in distinguishing between heat and temperature. I mean, you won't. You're all educated biters. And uh, so you, you know what it's all about. Like heat is like little packages that come floating down the river. And at the back of the mill, I've got four domestic radiators. Well, actually, two double radiators in the goit of the mill, and the water flows over them all the time. Now, the temperature of the water in the river is it's probably quite high now for that river. It might be 15 degrees centigrade, but in the winter, it's probably more like 5 degrees centigrade. So there's not a lot of heat, but you only need to take a little bit of heat out of every cubic meter that passes, and, uh, and it can add up to a lot. And so through these two heat pumps, which work on latent heat, 
principles, which I'm sure you all understand, but I won't go into it now. Um, the water coming in at 15 degrees or 5 degrees is a heat exchanger, and I've got a tank of 800 litres of water at 65 degrees all the time um, coming out of the room because we, it's just like a fridge in reverse. The water coming in evaporates a refrigerant liquid into a gas and then a compressor driven by the electricity from the screw squashes that gas back into a liquid in the process liberating latent heat that goes into the um, water system to, in, in the tank. And that's, if you, if, you, if you go to the gents or the ladies uh, and you put the hot tap on, please don't leave it on like some people do, um, and hold your hand under it, you won't hold your hand under it for long because it comes out at about, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, we, we've got heat, we've got central heating, we've got electricity, wow. And the government pay me to do it. There's a thing called feed-in tariff for electric, electricity and there's a thing called renewable heat incentive for um, the heat. So I do it at my house. I've got eight holes in the ground and pipes come out the holes and carry um, antifreeze at the temperature of the ground a long way down and that heats my house. And the government send me a cheque for 1,500 quid every quarter to, to pay me for doing it. It's a no-brainer. Why are you all doing it? I don't know. I can't understand it. I've put heat pumps in Bridge Mill too two massive industrial heat pumps in the Birchcliffe Centre. So that place is like toast now, it's wonderful. Um, my daughter's place over in Linden Mill. Um, a farmer friend of mine in Rippenden, another one up the top of Skit. Why aren't you all doing it? I mean, it save the planet and, and make money. So it's a no-brainer. Why don't we do it? I mean, I've got the screw there. I've got a piddly little weir across the river about 1.5 metres high. I haven't got much head. There isn't much flow, especially at the moment. Now, this river's drying up. I don't know why. Somebody will have to ask Yorkshire, Yorkshire Water at the top. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm generating kilowatts of electricity from that. Why didn't the town hall do this when it built its new extension and refurbished the town hall? Why didn't they have a, a turbine out there? I don't know. Why don't people do these things? Why don't we have a turbine on every estuary in this country? Or why don't we have dozens of turbines on multi-basin dams across the Bristol Channel, Liverpool Bay, Morecambe Bay, the Solway, the, what's the thing called at Glasgow, the Clyde, you know, and right round the Forth, the Humber. We could supply Europe with electricity. We could become the, the Saudi Arabia of Europe in, in some ways. We could be powering it. We needn't buy it all from Russia or anybody else who's going to hold us to ransom. Why don't we do it? I'm just, I'm just baffled. You're the ideas, people. Get at them. Thank you right. so much, David.